Welcome to Fan Counters. My name is Nick. And I'm Elizabeth. And we are all over social media on Twitter and Instagram at Fan Counters Live. You can also follow us on Facebook by searching for Fan Counters. And if you want, you can email us at hello at fancounters.com. Now, Elizabeth, we are taping the show the day after Memorial Day weekend. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was crazy at my house. I heard. Well, we opened the pool. So the pool was ready on Friday. So as soon as my kids got home from school on Friday, they're like, can we go in the pool? Can we go in the pool? Sure. So we spent an hour in the pool and we had something else to do. So I pulled them out and I'm like, look, you can spend every moment for the next three days in the pool if you want. So Saturday, we did just that. By 10 a.m., we were already in the pool. <laughs> and uh, I we applied sunscreen. We did all that. So we were good. Um, my brother-in-law was here with his daughter and... He was very good at making sure everybody had reapplied throughout the day. I did not. I thought, oop, I applied once. I'm good. Oh, for God's sake. (laughs) Do you not read the bottles? Yeah, it says good for 80 minutes. I read it after (laughs) the next day when I woke up with the worst sunburn pain of my recent memory. Oh. Oh, my shoulders are burnt. My back is burnt. Everything hurts so bad. I couldn't sleep. It's been terrible. So if you're out there, apparently you need to reapply sunscreen every 60 to 80 minutes. Yeah. And it probably lasts less when you're in the water all the time. But Yeah. And the water intensifies the sun. Oh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So I'm hurting today, guys, but uh, I'll be okay. Now, of course, I um, am older than you. And um, <laughs> older said. is wiser. <laughs> enough said. But I have uh, huge memories of lying out at our lake cottage covered in baby oil. Baby oil? Yeah. I mean, it's just like frying a chicken, let me tell you. Oh, no. <laughs> you would intend, yeah, we all did it in the uh, 70s. And um, because that you, you would get this just golden brown tan. I mean, mm. it literally is like putting butter on a chicken skin <laughs> inside the oven. And you would get this beautiful golden tan. And then we've all learned that that's not a good idea. Mm-hmm. We also put lemon juice in our hair. And uh, I recently found some pictures. I am a dirty blonde. But recently found some pictures of some pretty white blondes that obviously were a lot of lemon juice in my hair because it, it uh, bleaches out your hair. Oh, okay. Yeah. So for the summer, it was a lot of lemon juice and baby oil. And now neither of those things are good for you. A couple bad decisions. <laughs> anyway, we hope you had a good Memorial Day weekend, even though it's not Memorial Day weekend the day after anymore. Um, so let's move on. Joining us today is a very talented actor who is currently playing the dad of a superhero on the newest Marvel Universe TV series on the Freeform Network, Cloak and Dagger. Miles Musendon has also appeared on the very popular Netflix series, Stranger Things. How many times have we heard that show come up on this show? Yeah. Yeah. He's also been on other hit shows like Army Wives, Queen Sugar, Bloodline, Ballers, Secrets and Lies, and Mr. Mercedes. Miles hasn't always been a television actor. His story begins in 2010. Today we'll hear about how growing up in a low-income neighborhood inspired him to help others and how he went from owning his own record company to getting starring roles in Hollywood. I have a feeling everyone can relate to something on the show today. All right, let's get going. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters with Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. I continually will get stopped. Can I take a picture? We're going to, oh my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about it. (laughs) That's why we call it Fan Counters. I don't think you're going to last on the air very long. Miles, welcome to Fan Counters. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for having me. Now, we talked about many roles in our intro, and we can't wait to hear about some of them, like the Cloak & Dagger series you're uh, about to appear on. Also, we've heard about this show tons uh, from other guests, but you've made an appearance on Stranger Things, so I want to talk about that. But let's start uh, at the beginning, when you were in okay. uh, New York, going to the New York Academy of Dramatic Arts, did you go there because you had a strong interest in acting at the time? You know, um, this was way back when I was a kid, and my mom, uh, you know, I was doing, I was acting in school, and we were doing a bunch of plays, and we'd go on tour with these plays, 
and they actually uh, uh, give me a scholarship to go to some kind of uh, sleepaway camp mm-hmm. for drama. But um, even with the scholarship, my mom couldn't afford the rest, so I couldn't go there. So I guess she might have felt bad or something. So she um, she worked out and arranged for me to go to the Academy of Dramatic Arts and said. Now, growing up in New York City, it gives aspiring actors a bit of an advantage, not just because of the amount of auditions, but the opportunity to study performers on Broadway is also an advantage in itself. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience in Martin Ritz's class as he cast you as the lead bad guy in a touring show and what that did for you? Yeah, um, you know, it was, and, and you know, and again, this was school stuff. Um, you know, I, I I was always picked to do these. I, I don't know how it happened or how it worked out, but um, I was always picked to do these little things that you needed a ham to do as a kid and uh, do these uh, speeches like Impossible by Irma, Irma Simington Black. And when I got to, uh, to Martin Ritt, uh, Mr. Ritt had me uh, doing these plays, uh, Oliver Twist, um, I played Fagin, Ro- Robin Hood. Okay. And I was a captain, uh, the, the sheriff of Nottingham, and you know, uh, several of these plays, and we would go and do them in school, and then we would go on tour and take them to other schools um, in and around Brooklyn. And then he also would take us to, uh, to Broadway. You know, um, and that's how I got exposure to, to Broadway and actually um, um, opera and that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, that had a tremendous impact because, uh, you know, I fell in love with it after that. And especially, I think a little bit of it had to do with the fact that I can not go to school uh, <laughs> uh, for a day of time and uh, be able to hang out with my friends was, uh, was, was pretty cool and a part of it as well. So walk us through how growing up in a lower income neighborhood leads you to start your own record company where you produce like hip hop and reggae mu- music artists who have won Grammys. Yeah, yeah you know, um, I was in front because I, uh, you know, when I was a kid and I was doing acting, I remember, I, I remember telling a friend that I, you know, um, I, I'm going to be an actor when I grew up. And I guess a lot of people had expectations for me to be an actor when I grew up. But uh you know, um, some people in my neighborhood used to laugh and it wasn't cool to be an actor, <laughs> you know, or what, say you wanted to be an actor, but music mm-hmm. and hip hop and reggae music was, was popping, you know, and that was really cool. And I did like music as well. Um, so it ended up being the next, next best thing. So I used to actually uh, go around and uh, sing myself um, at little local um, venues and events, but I knew too many people that can sing really well. And actually, that's how I met my my girlfriend, who became my wife. And she was an artist, um, um, and she started doing pretty well. And I ended up uh, just kind of from being around her, getting involved with the people that were producing her. And um, I, I had, ended up getting together with them, and we started a record company and started producing. And I, I, from there, you know, I was going to spend time in, in Jamaica, uh, and my friend Mikey Bennett, uh, who's, who's a uh, noted writer and producer, we got together and we got uh, two friends records going um, and we didn't need much money. It was an underground label at the time. And we were doing, you know, we were producing Shabarangs and Dennis Brown and a bunch of uh, reggae artists. Um, and that was really the, 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 um, the major thing in the music. So I felt like it always felt like I was on the verge of something really big, but um, again, back then uh, reggae music was underground and hip hop to some extent was also underground. And then you just had some artists really starting to break out and uh, um, um, really blow up. Was there a moment where leaving the music business seemed like the right thing to do? I mean, at what point do you decide I'm going to quit music to pursue my acting? Well, you know, I was um, estranged from my father for many years and it was a weird thing, man. I was at uh, the Black Expo um, in New York uh, by myself and I'm walking around and I bump in, well, I didn't bump into him. I saw my dad, who I hadn't seen in years. Wow. The strangest thing happened. I bumped into him. Um, literally, he was right in front of me. We walked in and eyes met together. I don't know if this was destiny or what. It was just very strange. And um, he actually was um, uh, at a, had a booth there um, uh, for, for McDonald's. Because oh. he was a, owner, a McDonald's owner operator. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. So, so, um, I bumped into him and, you know, we see each other and it was like, okay, so what happens now? And we actually started talking 
uh, we talked a bit and he gave me his card and, um, you know, we had a quick conversation and then that was it. And I left, um, went about my business and, um, told my, uh, the same girlfriend I talked to you about that was in the music. I told her uh, later what happened and she was fascinated by the whole thing. And this was, uh, not long before we were scheduled to get married. So, um, in telling her, she was like, Oh, she wants to meet him. And I'm like, ah, oh, no, nah, nah, nah. and, and, um, she pushed and pushed and, um, I end up, uh, I end up, uh, um, talking to him again. And, um, we actually invited him to the wedding. And uh, anyway, we started having, uh, we kind of rekindled our relationship. And at the time he was, uh, again, at McDonald's when operating, he was growing and he, he, uh, started talking to me about McDonald's and something called the second generation ownership and, uh, getting, talk to me about getting involved in McDonald's. Now, in the music, I always felt like I was on the verge of something big happening, but right. it wasn't. So it used to look like it was great because, you know, I'm riding around limousines and, you know, I'm running around with these underground stars. Right. So, you know, I'm traveling all over and I'm going on tour and in Europe and stuff. So it looked like, you know, I'm you know, doing great. But really it was, you know, yeah, I was doing all these things. but I wasn't really making a lot of money. So um, what he said sounded enticing to me. And um, I also had a daughter. And I was getting married, and I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe, it, maybe it is something to look into. So um, I end up uh, getting involved in, in uh, working in fast food. Okay. Um, and and, uh, learning, and, 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 and so that that's what that's what kind of took me away from music because I was still doing music while I was doing that, but it, it proved that I couldn't do both at the same time because it takes a lot of energy to run these restaurants. Right. Wow. So you're running restaurants. So where does acting come in for you? Yeah, well, you know, um, I, I don't know. Some, I, everything I would do, somehow acting would get involved. It's just a very strange thing. And we were, um, um, McDonald's uh, has a training program. I didn't even know that the training program was uh, the second biggest in the world next to the military. So uh, I learned, I, tra- I, I got trained up at McDonald's uh, system. So then I was in charge of training the people in our stores. Okay. Uh, we had like three stores at the time. And, um, but I made a little adjustment to the way we would do the training where I introduced these skits and these role plays. So we would, when we would teach, um, I would have them one at one person play the customer. And then while you're doing the cashier work and actually make an order and let's go through the whole process yeah. and act like you're really, you know, and, uh, that type of thing. So I didn't know it caught on. Apparently, um, a, a word got around about this training and, uh, McDonald's came and visited the store. Uh, the McDonald's corporate, uh, corporate uh, um, folks. Okay. And, uh, you know, usually when they come, they're like inspecting and this and that. So I didn't know why they were <laughs> like, coming there. Like uh, being called so, to the know, principal's office. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, oh, 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 man, is everything okay here? Yeah. You know, um, so, but uh, we they came and we sat down and we talked about the, the training program and talked about what, I, what we were doing in our stores. And um, they took a look and took a look at how I had it uh, uh mapped out and, and that type of thing. And, um, yeah, that's what they came there for. And I, I had no idea. Nobody told me that. So they had, they ended up giving me, a, a an award, um, for enlightening the system. It was just a little light bulb pin okay. um, that was like, apparently very coveted. So I got a light bulb pin for enlightening the system of McDonald's when it comes to training. And I, and that was, uh, that was a pretty, uh, pretty awesome thing. Uh, back then to, to, to get recognized. So that's how acting kind of came in there. <laughs> you know, it was just, well, one of those things, you know, I just kept being drawn to it. So where, where geographically were you? Were you still on the East coast in the New York, New Jersey area? Yes, I was still in, I was still in New York. Uh, yeah, we had, um, and the restaurants were actually in uh, central Islip, um, in Massapequa and, uh, the other city, but yeah, it was in Long Island, New York. Okay. So, and I'm assuming maybe you still live there or do you live in LA? I mean, when do you make the jump to start no, doing I more? Have a, I have a, I have a place in, in Brooklyn. Um, I also have a place in Atlanta, so I live kind of flop back and forth, you know? Okay. Uh, mostly between places and then, you know, Louisiana now with the show, you know, I was spending several months uh, a year and prayerfully this will go well. So I will continue doing that. Now let's jump into some of your roles that you've taken on. Uh, one thing I noticed yeah. off the bat is you have a credit for the 2012 Denzel Washington movie Flight, which I thought was a, yeah. an amazing film. Um, but the one weird thing on your resume, and you can maybe tell us a little bit about this, you have a stunt credit on that film. So is there a story here with yeah. uh, what you were doing on that? 
Yeah, you know, um, I I went through a, a rough time, and um, you know, uh, I because uh, I, I left uh, I left the, the McDonald's system, and uh, you know, I started something different, and I was doing real estate development and this type of thing, and uh, you know, the things got rough, the economy, and but again, I was drawn back to acting. So while I was doing my development, I was doing great, and I used to do acting as a hobby. I would do at my church, and um, we would do these plays and that that type of thing. Okay, um, but when when the economy got uh, got rough, uh, my my business went under, and I was in deep dog doo doo. Mm. So um, because I I liked acting, I was really doing it. And it's okay if if I have to start all over, I might as well do something I love to do. And I I knew I loved acting, and it was something that I would do for free. So if I can get paid to do it, I say why not? So um, I got some opportunities, and I was doing actually stand in work. I was doing stand-in work over actually at Tyler Perry Studio, oh, okay. and uh, 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 yeah, and um, a casting director uh, called me, and this had casting director happened to be a friend, um, Bajo uh, called me and said, "Hey, uh, Denzel, apparently Denzel's uh, what did you call it? Uh, stand-in had gotten killed or died or something like that. Oh, and, geez. Uh, and so they needed somebody to they needed somebody that can that can really act." Um, to um, uh, be Daniel Standin, you know. At the time, again, I was I was doing I was I, I've done sta- I did standing work before, um, and I was doing standing work, uh, and I was also doing I was also acting in little indie films and that type of thing. So I, at the time, I was doing what you call a uh, Newborn County, a little movie called Newborn County, and I was doing standing uh, standing work uh, for BET or something. Um, as I, said, I was working as a for them and I was doing standing work for them. And uh, when he called me, I said, well, you know, um, you know, I, I am kind of doing a few things right now. Uh, but he, he told me that, well, Denzel standing, they actually work and they do scenes with the, the people that he works with. And, and that would be uh, John Goodman, um, uh, Bruce Greenwood, which Bruce is, uh, Bruce is really cool, is, uh, continues to be a friend. And um, uh, Don Cheadle, and to work with Robert Zemeckis, I thought, hey, that's a great opportunity. I have to at least go and see what's going on. So I went down there. I, I met with the I met with all of them, and uh, we did a screen. Uh, we did actually a, a, a actual screen test um, where uh, with me and Denzel, and they had us under the lights, and you know, and they actually had two other guys that were looking to do his standing work as well. Um, anyway, so uh, I left, and uh, next thing you know, they wanted me to actually they will actually offer me to do the stand in work. So, uh, I, I was under contract though with this, with this film I was doing and I asked them, Hey, you know, I got this opportunity to work with Denzel, you know, um, um, uh, would we be able to kind of play with the schedule? And no, they, 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 they said, no. Oh no. Said, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. They, they said no. So, um, and, 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 uh, image movers, they wanted me, well, you know, the flight folks wanted me to start working. I can't remember. I think it was that, Friday or whenever it was, uh, but I was uh, I I was I had to shoot the film. Mm-hmm. I couldn't go. So man, I don't know this this I guess just weird things happen, and I, I guess it's some kind of divine intervention. I don't know, but they said uh, I thought I figured that well they'll they'll give the job to somebody else. Seems like I couldn't do it. Right. But they put and changed the date. They changed the date. Um, to the Monday so that I can, I can come and do it, which was just incredible to me. Yeah. Um, they changed so that for you when, or did it just work out that way? Yeah. Yeah. It just, I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't call it. <laughs> so I left BT, I, I, but I was on the contract with the movie, so I couldn't leave the movie. I was doing that, right. which I wouldn't have left it anyway, because, you know, um, cause it's just standing work. Mm-hmm. Um, and the movie was low budget. So I was, I wasn't making a lot of money from the movie. I was, you know, uh, making about $150 a day or something like that. And uh, so anyway, I started doing the standing work for 125, working with these guys. And every once in a while I couldn't go because I had to go do this, uh, the movie, Newborn County. So they got a backup stand-in for me. So when I wasn't working, that person would work in my place. Just pretty incredible. Um, so I finished work doing doing a little indie film. So I was just working on flight, and but I would start getting these gigs. All of a sudden I would get offered these gigs. I couldn't go audition because I was shooting, I was doing fight, right. but they would just offer them to me. And, and it, I was like, I, I don't know what's happening, but um, I couldn't turn it down because I really <laughs> needed the money. Things were, were, were financially rough. And for the standing work, I think I was making $125 a day uh, working for Denzel. So what happened was um, 
they uh, decided that, you know what, um, they liked me, they liked, they liked my work, and they wanted me to be under contract as opposed to just doing the standard work and not being able to come sometimes. So they, uh, so uh, Steve Starkey, uh, who's Robert Zemeckis' partner, um, they asked Denzel if he would uh, allow me to do uh, to be a stunt double instead of his regular stunt double um, uh, so that I could be on the contract. And he said yes. Hmm. So here it is. I got an a Academy Award winning producer asking an Academy Award winning actor if I could do, uh, if I could be a stunt double. So I ended up being a stunt double and stand and they put me under contract, got me up, got me my, my own trailer and, and I was off to the races and all of a sudden I was Denzel stunt double. Wow. Did you do any crazy yeah. stunts on that film? Oh yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I did. Um, uh, and you, when you see the, in the plane, the, the plane turning over and all that kind of stuff. Anytime you don't see Denzel's face, it's you, you. That, that's me. That's my hands on, on the wheel. I, um, uh, doing that stuff, so yeah, I, I um I did the stuff. And a lot of the stuff though, Denzel he did them too. It's just that I did him first. So I guess I was kind of like the guinea pig. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that's what you're there for, yeah. so that Denzel doesn't get hurt. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it was amazing, and um, you know, I learned a lot, and it was a major confidence booster because you know, being his stand-in and stunt double, I got to do all the scenes first uh, before he would do them, and um. Man, I got. I was getting a lot of, and I was not that I was looking for that, but you know, when I did standing work, I did it to the best of my ability. I didn't like the actor. I knew all the lines. I studied everything. I was completely in character, like him. That's so, awesome. um, it, you know, and then it was just amazing because uh, a lot of the, a lot of the choices he would make were the same choices I made. Hmm. Um, okay. And so it was weird, and I, and I was like, well, maybe I don't need to be doing standing work because, um, you know, but then. Uh, uh, I saw Denzel do this scene. It was a scene where they were in the hangar, uh, the airplane hangar, him and, uh, uh, what's my, what's the, what's her name? I'm so sorry. She's from the same town as me in England too. Uh, I can't, the lead, the girl that played lead, I can't remember her name at the moment. They were in the hangar and he was drunk and, um, they were having this discussion. Now the, the, the scene wasn't really flowing when they were trying, when, when we did the rehearsal, it wasn't flowing. And, um, Denzel said, uh, 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 asked Robert um, Zemeckis uh, to to just clear everybody out. Let's get everybody out. You know, just the, whoever needs to be here. Um, so it was just uh, the DP, you know, uh, Bob. Um, but the as as his stand-in and stunt double, I had to be there too. So and I was there, and I saw something that was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen, and. Denzel, like, 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 he became a different person in that moment. It was just freaking phenomenal. And I, I don't, it was mind blowing for me um, that he just, it was almost like it was not him. And I'm, sta I'm standing there. I saw the whole thing. I saw them clear everybody out. I see everything in it. And, um, and, and I realized that in that moment that, yes, I, I'm in the right place and I have a lot to learn um, um, from Denzel. <laughs> and uh, actually, by the end, by the end of the movie, he said, uh, "Oh man, you 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 had a you had a master class." Wow! <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I had I had a master class, man. That was the best training that I could have ever had. Those those three and a half months uh, months with Denzel uh, working under Denzel was was just uh, phenomenal. What an experience! How cool! <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk about Cloak and Dagger. Yes, it's, it's now showing on Freeform Network, and it stars Olivia mm -hmm. Hoyt. And Aubrey Holt. Mm -hmm. Holt. I'm sorry. It stars Olivia Joseph. Holt and Aubrey Joseph, and you play Aubrey's Correct. father. Now, I, I know yeah. you do have kids. Are how old are your kids? I have one that's 28, one that's 23, one that's 20, one that's 18, and one that's 11. Oh, so it's pretty easy for you to fall into character of being a parent with all that parenting experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. A a absolutely. You know. Uh, it, I'm surprised. I just started playing dads recently um, because, uh, you know, I I didn't have gray hair and I looked a little young, so they wouldn't see me as a father. But um, even though I had a bunch of kids, yeah. But uh, Queen Sugar and uh, and then Cloak and Dagger, I got some gray hairs in the last few years, and boom, I'm, <laughs> I can play dad now. So yes. Cloak and Dagger is part of the Marvel universe. Have you always mm -hmm. been a superhero fan or a fan of the Marvel yeah, productions? Yeah. 
Yeah, I was uh, um, both. I, you know, not, I, I was a superhero fan in general, period. I mean, I, Marvel was probably, my, I think, most people's favorite. But, you know, I used to, I used to watch, uh, look at the comics as a kid, and I used to watch, you know, Spider, uh, Spider-Man, and they had the, uh, the Hulk used to come on TV when I was a kid, mm-hmm. you know, uh, with Luke, you know, playing the, you know, playing the Hulk. And, uh, you know, so I, I grew up a, a fan. And then even as an adult, you know, with, with when, this, when the movie started coming out, by the, it's about 10 years ago, with the first Iron Man and all that kind of stuff, man, I was all in. So yeah, I mean, you know, I, I love the whole uh, the whole thing uh, with the with the superheroes and the, and the Marvel films. Now, on Fan Counters, we talk a lot about, about experiences with fans, or even if you've been starstruck by somebody. And I read a funny story where you bumped into another Marvel family member, Anthony Mackie, at the <laughs> airport. So how did you handle that yeah, encounter? Yeah. <laughs> you know, man, I, I um, I was I was very excited about being part of a Marvel. You know, and I feel like I'm I'm part of the Marvel family too. So I saw Anthony like I'm thinking, well, okay, it's, it's family. You know, it's all in the family. But Anthony didn't know me from 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 Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we're in the uh, the uh, security line uh, going going through, and I was like, oh, there goes Anthony. Uh, 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 there goes Anthony. I'm thinking like, oh man, that's that, that's family. You know, so but he was going through the uh, the. Uh, Security. Uh, whatever they did to check to see if you have metal, metal on you yeah. or whatever. Um, he was walking through. He went through before me. Um, so then I went through um, a few people after, but he was still waiting on his bags to come down that uh, conveyor, you know, when yeah. they, they scanned yeah. the bag. So um, so I walk up, and I, I'm going in to give him a big fist bump, man. Like, hey, you know, so I say, hey, what's up, cuz? <laughs> you know, and Anthony like, looked at me. You he know, thinks you're another crazy like, fan. I don't know if he's looking at me a fan, but because I came up to him like as if I knew him, oh, okay. Because I felt like I knew him, you know, I, you know, <laughs> from from the movies, and and I, and I and I love his work. Period. Even outside of the, uh, even outside of his role, um, um, in in the Avengers and stuff, and uh, you know, what's up? Because I, I I put my hand in his bum, so he he looked at me and he kind of like slowly, kind of like uh, like he wasn't he was unsure, and he kind of like just he made a fist too. He kind of like tapped the back of my hand with his fingers <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> nice. and, and um you know uh, kind of grabbed his bag and like you know uh just kind of slowly walked away <laughs> and i was like okay you know i i didn't bother to tell him that you know uh this about well, uh about cloak and dagger or anything like that i just let i let that one go i figured he'll figure it out later there you yeah. go yeah now your son on the yeah. show is a superhero right Yes. Now, as his dad on the show, are you, I'm just wondering, are you a former superhero as well, or what can you tell us about your character? I don't know if I can tell y'all that. I don't know if I should tell y'all that. Um, that <laughs> remains to be seen. I don't know. Okay, all right. Well, just let, let me interrupt here a second. Cloak and Dagger is the one I keep seeing the commercials for where your son is black, and he seems to be, like, the dark side. And then there's a mm-hmm. white very white, white girl who seems to be the light side. So is this much yeah. more of like a yin and yang kind of thing? Um, uh, in, I guess in some respects, you know, but, okay. uh, but, but, but there's no necessarily, there's not necessarily one negative and one positive. Okay. You know, okay. um, you know, like I know in the comics, like I know some people would, would see Cloak as like, uh, uh, they would like talk about a uh, uh, dagger. He's an ang- angelic type thing, and like as a cloak with some kind of demon. Right. But it's not like that at all. <laughs> okay. You know, um, you know it, it, it's like it's like a synergy. You know, um, they 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 both are are, are are moving by themselves, but they're a real force when they when they're together, and um, it, it it kind of exponentially kind of kind of boosts their power a bit, uh, so to speak. But, but they're uh, both on the good but, side. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's relative. It depends okay. on the situation because right. the kids, these are teens and they're going through life. Okay. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, mm-hmm. even without power, you we know, kids are bad decisions. I mean, do you want to call them bad when right. they make bad decisions? They're not necessarily bad kids. Right. But sometimes sure. they make bad decisions. Sure. So if you're, if you're a kid, um, and you, if you're a teenager and you have these powers and sometimes you make bad decisions, that doesn't necessarily mean you're bad. Right. You know, so uh, it's kind of like that. So they they do things, and some of it, you know, depends on how you look at it. 
and how you know with your perspective some people see it as bad and some people see it as justice so what do you think would be the ultimate superpower if you got to choose one you know if i got to choose a superpower for me it would be the, the power to use uh, a, a larger percentage of my, of my mind okay mm. you know i have to use you know, even if it was, I think they say we use 10% now, even if it were 50%, um, I think we have a untapped just genius inside of us that can kind of change the world and make it a better place for all of us. So if I had that, I feel like I can, I can, I can make the world better. Okay. Yeah, there were a couple of TV shows back um, just a few years ago, actually, about that, where they unlock and this guy's got all this power of knowledge and uh those always make for good shows. So I'm actually really looking forward to this Cloak and Dagger show. Are yeah. you the kind yeah, of person, yeah. Miles, that is excited about the possibility of going to all the cons, like Comic-Con and stuff, to be a part of these Cloak and Dagger panels that I'm sure will arise? Because I read that you did a lot of research after filming so you could have better interactions with fans. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know how much they're going to have uh, uh, me do because I know for now a lot of the stuff that's happening is mainly uh, – Aubrey and Olivia are doing, you know, uh, most of the stuff right now. So it depends on what they have us do. I, I've been kind of watching and, and you know, uh, on, just on, on online and, and when we put out the trailers and that type of thing, kind of seeing the fans and seeing the, the kind of comments they make. And I just felt like, well, you know what, let me make sure I fully understand, <laughs> you know, what's going on. So, so um, you know, in, on, the, on the comic book side. So that I can understand, because I, so, I think some of them had some challenges with with uh, some of the changes, and you know the fact that we were we were shooting in um, New Orleans as opposed to New York, mm -hmm. and um, them the way they get their powers because they they took some creative liberties and made some changes, but I think they're great changes. Okay. Um, uh, uh, you know, so I just wanted to be able to understand and be able to, to kind of face off and talk with these folks. And yeah, I want to be able to interact. I mean, you know, uh, I'm privileged. I'm, I'm, I'm so lucky to be part of the Marvel universe. So I want, I'm fully, I want to fully embrace it in, in every aspect. So it sounds like the filming experience for the show was really intense because you mentioned that there were a lot of low lows due to the subject matter of the show. Is this an example of how personally vested you feel everybody was in the show and making it? Yeah, you know, um, man, so, so the things that happen in the show are, are some of them are, are really heart wrenching. And, um, you know, a lot of people I know for me and for a lot of the, the, the crew, it was like a labor of love, man. We had our, our crew uh, people, they were making their own t shirts and give, hand them out, and people making buttons and people making hats and you know all kinds of stuff they really were fans um so we we are fans ourselves uh, but there are there are a lot of things that happen um in season one that um again are very intense and very heart-wrenching and, and you know so for me to kind of go there because you know it, it's interesting i know we're actors but the thing is, when we're doing these scenes, it's kind of like you take yourself to a place that you're really having the emotion. Mm -hmm. You're really having the feeling. So even though we're actors, but we are still really experiencing that, at least some of us are really expressing what that character is feeling at the time. So to be able to get there, sometimes, you know, it, 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 it's a little bit depressing. Gotcha. You know, um, just in, pre in preparing to do that so we can give you something, we can give the audience something that's authentic and real. Okay. Um, you know, but, but then they have moments of levity, you know, in the show that kind of, you know, uh, uh, lift things up and then it's, it's, it's all right. We patch, patch, we patch back up by the end. <laughs> Normal TV. Uh, yeah, bring it around. <laughs> yeah, bring, bring it to closure in the hour. Yeah. Um, now, I know that Marvel's pretty secretive with their projects, and I understand at first you didn't even know that it was a Marvel project you were auditioning for. Do you remember what you thought it was that you were going in for? You know what? I had no clue. I just thought it was some kind of high-end drama. Okay. Um, you know, because I, and, and again, I was auditioning for a lot of stuff, you know, um, at the time. Um, things were really kind of starting to happen for me, so I was auditioning for a lot of series regular stuff. 
Um, so, you know, I wasn't really spending a lot of time. If, if I didn't know what it was, if I knew what it was, I can research and I can kind of get ready for the audition. But because I didn't know, I just kind of did it and moved on, <laughs> you know, just so it happened that, um, you know, that particular, the, the, the kind of mock side that I had, uh, it just really resonated with me. Uh, again, maybe it's from being a father and, and uh, you know, um, kind of understanding where, uh, what this, with, with, he was called Michael Johnson at the time, what Michael was feeling, uh, was Otis, what Otis was feeling, uh-huh. um, was talking to us because of the scene by scene was of just a father son scene. Um, and I just, I just, I don't know. I just somehow innately understood, um, and, and vibed with this thing. So it just, it just flowed. And I actually, it, it, I didn't even have to really study it. I, I literally read it two or three times and I didn't have to memorize it anymore. It was just there. Wow. Um, and I'm not usually that great with that. I usually have to kind of, uh, <laughs> run it with somebody over and over and over again for it to get in my, uh, in my, in my system. So I don't have to think about lines, but not, not in this case. So how fast did they shoot this show? Were you doing like an episode a week or did they take like eight or nine days to do one? What was your schedule like? Um, yeah, it was like, uh, I think it was like a seven day um, for, for each episode. The show is called Fan Counters. And we like to yes. ask our guests about their favorite fan encounter. So tell us something okay. that you that sticks out in your mind that was memorable, whether good, bad, or something that you've had with a fan. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it wasn't for this show, because I don't think people know me that much yet for this show until it comes out. But um, I had an experience, I don't know if I should be talking about another show, it was a, uh, my first TV show, um, um, Army Wives. Um, and, you know, I had this uh, role where I was a notification officer and I had to tell um, the lead uh, the lead of the show uh, that their son was killed in action in Afghanistan. Yikes. And, uh, yeah, there was a part uh, in it when I was talking to them and, and uh, uh, the son, his fiance was there as well. And she had some, she was trying to ask me questions, but, um, these military guys, they can only speak to the next of kin, ah. you know, so they weren't mapped yet. So I could not talk to her about it. Mm-hmm. And I, so the scene was very intense, um, very emotional. And, um, as I was leaving, she, she, she kind of, um, touches or grabs my arm to ask me, um, to, uh, to ask me something about him. So I kind of looked down at her touching me because, you know, she's not supposed to really touch me. And uh, uh, I look at her and let her know, uh, I'm sorry, I can only, you know, I can only uh, speak to the next of kin. And then I walked out and left her standing there. And she, she started crying her eyes out and ran off. One particular encounter, I'll tell you, I was at the, uh, picking up my, uh, my, one of my kids, uh, I guess my son at the daycare center. And this, uh, this lady, while I'm inside, there's like, you don't have to do that. Oh, yikes. Right? And I was like, I, I, I look, I was like, I'm wondering what's going on. Yeah. And then she's, I didn't realize she's talking to me. <laughs> you know, so, and I had no idea what she was talking about. And she's like, you, you could have told her. And then, and she's going, I could have told her. Um, I said, oh, I, you know, it's a script. Right. <laughs> you know, it was TV, right? <laughs> you know, it, it was, it, it's TV. And it's a script. I, I can only follow the script. And uh, that was, uh, for me, one of the most uh, strange encounters. And I've had several encounters when it came to that particular show and that scene uh, for, for, uh, for uh, some reason. But uh, that was the, the, the strangest one because, because as she was creating a scene. And I didn't know I was in, in the scene with her. Uh, <laughs> Sometimes people forget this is just all made yeah. up, guys. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's funny. Well, I think you're going to have a lot of... Yeah, exactly. We're gonna, I think you're going to have a lot of more encounters with fans once Cloak & Dagger premieres. Yeah, have you, have you all seen it? No, no, like I thought it doesn't it premiere no. June seventh. It comes out on June seventh, and we didn't get we weren't sent the preview, so we have not seen it. All we can see are the, um, the there's uh, a trailer promos. Yeah, TV, there's a trailer yeah. out, and that's all that we can uh, see. Okay. And it's just, I mean, like I said, it okay, just shows yeah. us that they're light and dark. And um, not until I read the page did I realize that they were actually dating or that they were even knew each other. Because you don't get that from the trailer. Yeah, well, man, you know what? I, you know, I, I, I love this show because it, 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 
just has a very authentic feel to it. Um, they, the way that they shot uh, um, um, this, it was like, as if we were shooting a feature film. Okay. You know, it didn't even like doing TV. Um, and, you know, it with Gloria uh, Rubin and it, I mean, the whole cast, Andrew, uh, uh, just, you got some really strong actors that are doing great work. And um, I think people, people will, I can, I can imagine with what happened with Army Wise, I can imagine that with this show, because there are a lot of stuff that people are going to have a lot of different positions on how it was handled. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I guess I have a lot to look, look forward to. Now, Miles, before our time is up, I've got to jump back a couple of years to find out about a smaller role you had in the Netflix series Stranger Things. You played a cop in that show. Yes. And it seems like every yes. celebrity we yes. talk to tells us they're watching this show. Yeah. So since you were on it, do you have any behind the scenes things that you can share with our audience about what it was like to work on the show? Well, yeah. Um, yeah, that was an interesting thing too, because I thought, uh, I thought uh, I was going to be doing a bigger role in that show. Um, because I, I auditioned for, um, not the role I had. I actually auditioned to be, uh, the, the, I forgot the young, the black kid, uh, in on the show is dad. Oh, okay. But I think they made, they end up making that an extra role or something like that or, or something. And then I auditioned for another role to be, uh, somebody that, I don't know. I even have, I even have the, the, uh, the audition. I put it on YouTube, um, because, uh, uh, you know, I like the audition, but anyway, um, so, uh, when I got offered a role in the show, uh, it was different from what I auditioned for, and I was not interested in, in the role. So I actually ended up not um, taking the role and declining um, the role. Um, and then they came back later, uh, a few weeks later, with this other with this role, and it was supposed to be actually a couple of episodes, from what I was told by my agent. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, you know, I, I, I we didn't know what the show was going to be. You know, nobody knew that the show was going to be this phenom phenomenon that it turned out to be. Right. Um, and I loved it. Uh, I loved first season. You know, it was great. You know, uh, but uh, so I I just go there to do to do my thing with this role. I, I kind of just uh, got it, got an offer for this role, and I had to be there the next day to shoot it. So you know, go down there, and everybody's really cool, man. You know, uh, uh, everybody's. Uh, uh, you know, nobody has any kind of issues. And, and I remember the, uh, Sean, <laughs> Sean Levy, uh, I'm in the, we get, we're there, get ready to the scene. So he, he, he asked me, uh, okay, so, um, you know, you know, the lines <laughs> and, um, I thought that was funny because, uh, you know, we're getting rid of the scene and shoot the scene. Yeah, so exactly. I, really like I better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so, so, uh, he goes off and, um, here we go, and we're, 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 we're shooting the scene, and um, you know, I'm doing a scene with David Harbour, and he he pulls up in this truck. So I'm there in this booth, man, and this truck is like uh, 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 on, running <laughs> while we're doing the scene, and uh, it's like a, I don't know if you saw like a bunch of smoke coming from the exhaust, uh -huh. mm. and it feel like it's on the scene. So we're doing a scene, you know, and uh, uh, we get we kind of get to and get to the end. So I throw I threw on a tag at the end of the scene. Um, so uh, what are you burning there, man? Diesel? Because you're smoking me the <laughs> out. Oh, I don't know if I can curse on you guys. <laughs> Sorry, we can bleep it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, the whole place, everybody's laughing and Sean they're coming running over, and uh, you know, man, it, it really broke the ice. And uh, man, we so we had a good time, man. We were just rolling with it and um, having fun with the scene and just tried it a few different ways and, and um, yeah, it was, it was great. I had a great time there and it seemed like uh, I liked that. They liked me and it went really well. In fact, you know, they used that scene. of like all these great scenes and stranger things, but David was like on a lot of like late night shows and um, they were using that scene on a bunch of, a uh, bunch of stuff. Somebody called me from Canada saying, Hey, uh, David's uh, doing an interview and uh, they just showed a scene with you and him and, like, oh, man, that's freaking cool. That is that awesome. Is One thing I found really interesting about you is that you love to travel. And in your bio, it says that you have explored ancient cities throughout the world. So I was just wondering, what places have you visited that stand out as uh, memorable for you? Man, you know, um, I, I uh, Teotihuacan. You know, there's the places I like. I love, I love these ancient places where you have uh, ruins, you know, from the old world is what I like to call it anyway. I feel mm -hmm. like there was a time when we, 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 there was an advanced 
people that live, I feel like this is not I feel almost like we something happened where we lost what we knew. But these folks were building these these temples. They were building these pyramids, and um, it's just it's just amazing. So I love going to see them. Um, um, I love going to spend time and kind of look at artifacts and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, man, you know, um, you know, Bulgaria. Well, actually, in Bulgaria, I was doing that Tom Story, but we just, I mean, we were in some caves over there, and man, just some beautiful mm-hmm. stuff all over the world. And um, so I am on a mission. I want to go everywhere, and I want to see it all. Awesome, Miles. Well, it's been a great hour with you. We thank you very much for joining us. Can you let us know where we can find you on social media? Yeah, um, I, I'm not that great at social media, but I, I have a I have a Twitter account. It's Miles Mustenden. I don't know how to tell you that, but it's you know Miles Mustenden, the Twitter, I guess, or whatever. Um, uh, at Miles Mustenden. Okay. I, I don't know. Um, and then I have Instagram. It's all it's all my, Miles Mustenden. Awesome. I have Facebook, and that's Miles Facebook slash Miles Mustenden. And I will learn this. I will know this because I know we're going to be doing live from uh, from uh, Marvel Studios <laughs> at some point. So I'm going to have to know how to articulate this a little bit better. <laughs> no, that's okay. Well, I know your Twitter is filled with stuff on Cloak and Dagger, which premieres on the Freeform yeah. Network on June seventh. So we can't wait to check that out. And if uh, you know, as we get further along, if you want to come back and talk, tell us more about it, and spend more time with us, we'd love yeah. to have you back. Thanks for your time today. Yeah, uh, yes, thank y'all, and I would I would love to do that, and I'd love to. We can talk about what everybody, how you guys felt once you've seen it. Yeah, exactly. And um, see if uh, it'd be interesting to see it, and and and, uh, and you, I know you have the perspectives of your of the fans out there, so that would be great. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Miles. Have a great rest of your day. Yes, thank you. You all too. Our thanks to Miles Misenden for joining us on the show today. We hope that you've had a chance to check out. Uh, the show Cloak and Dagger because it premiered, what was it, last week, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so um, pretty cool stuff. I really was thought it was funny. He used the word when he was talking about the Army Wives story, next of kin. And I remember reading something that stuck with me a while ago about that. It's the only redneck term we use on a, you know, on a, <laughs> everyday on a basis. colloquial basis, yes. <laughs> it's so funny. That is. But, you know, um, I... I I, I was surprised. I did not realize we were going to take a little McDonald's turn there in our conversation, but it does explain why he didn't start acting until 2010. He was busy doing other things. Right. And you know, I didn't, I did a lot of research on Miles before the show and I never ran into any mention about McDonald's. I yeah. was pretty surprised. Yeah. Owner operator. That's a big deal, especially if you have more than one. So yeah, I don't really know how long I didn't get from him, how long he'd been doing that, but golly. And what I, I wasn't counting, was it five or six kids as he was rattling off how old they were? <laughs> that would be five. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, that's a, lot. a lot of responsibility, which uh, I'm glad we stopped at two. Yeah, me too. <laughs> two is the limit here, people. Anyway. So, yeah. Join us on social media. You can email us comments about the show. Or if you have a guest that you'd like to have appear on Fan Counters, you can send it to hello at fancounters.com. You can also search for us on Instagram and Twitter at Fan Counters Live. And of course, we're on Facebook doing our updates every week with what show has uh, been recently put out with our links. And yes. uh, we'd love for you to join us there. Next week on the show, if you want to uh, be ready for it, you can watch season three and four of the show Bosch on Amazon. And then you'll be ready for our guest next week. Yes. Okay. Anything else? I don't think so. Have a fantastic, <laughs> this is, uh, you know, we're in full on summer now, so kids all the time. So I'm sure the next couple of weeks I'll have plenty of things to share with you about 24-7 children home for the summer. Well, they've been quiet upstairs so far. So yes, so I we're will, doing pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Anyway, have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. This was a podcast from the Podfix Network. Check out more shows like it at oddfixnetwork.com.